Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, our main speaker is Jerry. Help me welcome Jerry to the stage. Hello, my name is Jerry. I'm an alcoholic. Forever grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous and this way of life. Uh, it's an awesome journey that I've been on, you know, and it's with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, AA has given me a life that's beyond really dis any description, you know. It's the best deal in town for the alcoholic. And for the newcomers, you know, the seed has been planted, you know, and uh, nobody makes it to these rooms by mistake, believe me. You know, you're here for a reason and a purpose. And the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has shown me how to live and enjoy life without drinking one day at a time. You know, uh, I, like I say, I truly love AA. What it's given me is, is, is just something else. You know, it's a way of life that I choose. And the fellowship and the 12 steps and the big book, the whole shebang, you know, is, is, it's, it's just something different from where I came from. And a little bit prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was just out there running and gunning, you know, self-will run riot, you know. Uh, I remember I got into the service, I joined the service, I graduated from high school and I joined the service when I was 18. And I remember being stationed back east and uh, you could go drink at a bar, but the age limit, you had to drink three, two beer if you're under 21. And I always loved the effect of alcohol. And <clears throat> what I did, I went to the office one time and I told them that, you know, I lost my ID. So they made me up a new one and I lied about my age. I said that I was, you know, 21. And I used that for the next three years, you know, and that little piece of paper, I wish I would have kept it. It would have been an archive, you know, really. You know, it was worn out, but I kept it in my wallet until I turned 21. And then I was off and running again, you know. <clears throat> the thing I remember about the, the service is I remember in Korea, I went over there. It was peacetime, thank God. And I remember we'd go out drinking almost every night, you know, and I was 19 but there was no age limit over there, you know. And the beer was 10 cents a bottle, American beer, and whiskey was 20 cents a shot. And there'd be five or six of us sitting at the table, just full of beer, all you wanted, all, all the alcohol you wanted, you know. For that price, it was okay, you know. And we didn't drive, I didn't have a car, but we could walk back to the barracks, maybe 200 yards or something like that. And that was on a daily thing. And, uh, you know, coming back uh, to the United States, you know, drinking was just, in the military, it was just one of those things, you know, and uh, doing crazy insanity. But I did actually uh, graduate, you know, dishonor uh, an honorable discharge. And what I remember just before my discharge, I was standing in a for formation and <clears throat> to get my discharge papers. And instead of doing that, they called my name out. And I had to step forward and they handed me a piece of paper that because of the Berlin crisis, I was extended for three more months. And boy, was I pissed, you know, really, you know, because I wanted to get out bad, you know. But anyway, I stayed, the, it was like 120. 18 days and I was counting every one of them and uh, <clears throat> and I they didn't really give me a job so what I was doing just doing a lot of drinking you know and uh, it was crazy it was a place uh, back east in Massachusetts Fort Devens Massachusetts and but uh, eventually I did get out and when I got out came back to California that's where my parents were living with my stepdad and my mom, and uh, 
just started drinking, you know, and uh, never really gave it a second thought. You know, it was just it was just something, a way of life. And and I still remember today, the first time I smoked a joint was at a friend's house, and we were in a car. There was four of us, and the first joint I smoked. After that, I didn't come down for five years. You know, really, you know, I just fell in love with weed. And and back in California at that time, marijuana was a felony, you know, and uh, I wound up with seven of them. Well, seven felonies and two convictions because somehow good things happen, really, you know, uh, one time me and my wife was riding to uh, she was taking me to work and we get pulled over and there was like there's six or eight cops pulled us over you know they all came out from anyway they were searching the car and when they were searching the car they said you know while we're doing this I said, not really you know and uh, they says well we got you for three felonies and I, like I was growing it at the house and possession and sales and <clears throat> they took me to jail but going to court I actually beat the three felonies because back then in 1965 uh, the Amanda rights was just started and they didn't give them to me and the judge threw all three felonies out of court and I, yeah you know <laughs> and, <laughs> and there I go you know back out and getting loaded again and, you know, uh, in Tijuana, got arrested for three kilos. But I beat that case, too, because when they saw me, I started to run with the three kilos, and I threw them out in the bushes somewhere, and they finally caught up with me. And then they went back. They found the three kilos. And when I went to court in Tijuana, I was in, in the Mexican jail there, and there were, I can't remember... It was only like three bunks on one side and three on the other side, but there were like 10 or 12 of them in that cell. And <clears throat> went to court, everything was in Spanish, and they had an interpreter. And bottom line is, they threw it out. And the insanity of this disease, uh, they finally let me out of jail, and I'm headed for Del Mar, California, to my connections house to get loaded. You know, that's the insanity of this disease, believe me. And a uh, few more things, you know, like I said, I got uh, two convictions. When I first was, uh, they came to the house and we were partying and they found somewhere marijuana and they took me to jail. And I was dating this gal that uh, she actually bailed me out of jail. And I said, I'm going to hold on to this gal. You know, really, you know, and we got married and uh, uh, she bailed me out a few more times. And <clears throat> the last time when I got in jail, I was drinking and they pulled me over and I was drunk and they took me to jail and I called her up. I says, hey, uh, come bail me out and click, you know, <laughs> she was fed up with that. You know, and we finally got a divorce, and there was three kids involved, you know, uh, my two boys and uh, my daughter, you know. Uh, thank God, through Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a relationship with all three. It's so awesome, you know, when we, my daughter lives in Fresno. In fact, is my son and his wife are going to visit me this weekend, you know. And, uh, but anyway... I had no relationship with him when I was out there doing my thing, you know. And uh, what happened was that my wife, I came home one day and she was gone, packed up with the three kids and she was out. We were married about seven years and uh, she was fed up with what I was doing. And, but uh, thank God for that because the... <clears throat> She took everything of value out of the house. I actually owned a house in California, you know, that my mother gave me the down payment. But anyway, uh, 
she um, uh, got sidetracked. Anyway, uh, I came home one day and she was gone, packed up, and she was gone with the three kids. And the only thing of value in the house was my daughter's transistor radio. And I was listening to it one day and still doing my thing. And I remember today what they were advertising. It was called the Pasadena Alcoholism Council, you know. And they were advertising on the radio about alcoholism. And I was listening to it. And the first question, they ask questions on, on the radio. And the first question they last asked was, has your wife left you? you know, and that, wow, you know, really? You know, how'd they know? And the bottom line is, after listening to it for a couple of days, I wrote the phone number down. And then I finally called them. And they gave me the number of Alcoholics Anonymous. And believe it or not, you know, I'm a type of person, I wouldn't ask you the time of day. You know, I wouldn't ask you for any type of help or anything. <clears throat> but I actually picked up the phone, and I called AA. And uh, they told me where the meeting place was at. And this is anybody from California, uh, uh, Covina, California, you know. And uh, I actually went to the meeting. Or, or to the club, and when I went to the club at t 10 o'clock in the morning, it didn't open until noon. And my first thought was, hell, I ain't sticking around here. And when I turned around, there was a phone booth across the street. And the day before that, these, when I called AA, they actually 12-stepped me. Two guys came out with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I remember sitting at the table, and they would tell me, you know, things about Alcoholics Anonymous. And they actually gave me their phone number. And like I say, I'm the type of person. I wouldn't ask you for the time of day. But anyway, when I turned around to leave, there was a phone booth across the street. Now, to me, this is how Alcoholics Anonymous works. I actually walked across the street, and I called these two guys, or one of the guys that gave me their number, and within 30 minutes, they were outside of that club babysitting me until they got me into my first meeting. In my first meeting, <clears throat> I remember it, that I remember identifying with the results of my drinking. You know, wife leaving you, jail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I identified that way. I didn't identify with my feelings or emotions because that was zero. You know, believe me, and I did a damn good job of shutting off my feelings and my emotions. But <clears throat> when they were passing the basket at the end of the meeting, I raised my hand and I said, my name's Jerry. I'm an alcoholic. And from that day forth, my life changed because, thank God, the seed was planted. You know, that's... Uh, uh, I didn't get sober. You know, I stayed sober for... a I think this was on a Tuesday, and I stayed sober until Friday because Friday was my drinking day. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But <clears throat> then I stayed sober again, maybe for a week or two, and got. Anyway, bottom line was that I was in and out of AA for two and a half years. And the longest amount of sobriety I had was five months and 20 days. You know, and <clears throat> prior to that, I was in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and I remember the old timers. I was dating this gal that uh, drank beer only, and they said, "You better cut her loose. You're gonna wind up drunk." I says, "No way." I said, "She just drinks beer only," you know. But they were right. I wound up drunk, and uh, the old timers. I truly believe they saved my ass, you know. They told me exactly what I was doing, when I was doing it, and how I was doing it, and what I should be doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, coming back from, um, I was hitchhiking. Well, I took a bus to St. Louis, Missouri, and, I and then I started hitchhiking. 
And anyway, I got to the west side of Flagstaff, and I was out there hitchhiking. And this guy picks me up, and he says, uh, you don't mind if I stop and buy a six-pack? I said, it sounds good to me. You know, I was thirsty. And the thing is, when he bought the six-pack and we're leaving, going down the road, he was going to Kingman, I believe, or somewhere. But he hands me a beer, and I was thirsty. He said, I just downed it. And uh, can I have another one? He says, already? You know, he hands me the beer pulls over to the side of the road and says, get out, you know. And that was my last beer or alcohol. And from that day, uh, I finished hitchhiking to California, and I used to stay in a place called the Crossroads. I was in and out of that place for a few times, and I called this guy up. His name was Harry. And I says, Harry, I says, I need, oh, well, first I went to my ex-wife's place, Thought maybe she'd take me back, and she didn't. When I knocked on the door, she opens it and closes it, you know, just like that. So I called Harry, and uh, I said, Harry, I need a place to stay. He says, Jerry, he says, sounds like you're sober. I says, I am. I didn't drink today. And that was my first day of sobriety, you know. And I finished, uh, went over to the crossroads, and I stayed in there, and Started getting, uh, you know, sober. Uh, my sponsor, to this day, I know he sent these this couple over. The names was Al and Connie. And they said, uh, we're standing out on the back porch. And Jerry, you know, do you think your life is unmanageable and you're powerless over alcohol? And at that point, the only possessions I have ever had it was a little red carpet bag with a pair of jeans and a toothbrush. That's all I owned. And uh, I looked at him, and he looks me dead in the eye, and I look him right back, and I says, yes, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable. And I was looking him dead in the eyes, and I said, you know, and, and I felt when I did that, that was step one, you know. This, this disease is a cunning baffling and powerful disease and by staying sober you know uh, life believe it or not started to get better you know somehow you know uh, the 502 club like I said you know it was the old timers that saved my ass you know they would say something I remember one told me he says you know what Jerry you know you've been in and out of AA for a long time and I remember him saying this. He says, you're playing Russian roulette. Every time you go out, click. Went back out again, came back, click. He says, one of these days, it's not going to go click. You know. And, you know, and another old-timer told me, he says, Jerry, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. You know. And the thing is that, you know, by telling me the truth, it registered with me. You know, they wasn't lying, you know. Uh, alcoholism is a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease. And without help, it's too much for us. And uh, finally, uh, I was sober two years, which reminds me, my sobriety date is October 13th, 1972. And uh, the, uh, you know, s sobriety one day at a time is we don't drink no matter what. And the other thing is, you know, one old timer when I was in, anyway, it was a foundation I started building in Alcoholics Anonymous. And my foundation today is made out of concrete and steel. You know, I'm st so much involved in AA today, you know, I live out in Chino and I still go maybe five meetings a week, six meetings a week. You know, this is my second meeting today. You know, AA is a way of life that's giving me something beyond, you know. And uh, I haven't been, oh, I didn't tell you so much about the Los Angeles County Jail. Been there, done that, you know, really, you know. And uh, like I said, I, I was in there quite a few times. 
you know, with what, seven, six felonies, two convictions, and six or seven misdemeanors, all alcohol related or drugs, weed. Like I said, back in the 60s, weed was a felony. Now you get a, a card and you can smoke it, you know. God, I can't believe it. But anyway, <laughs> back in the day, you know. But anyway, you know, staying sober one day at a time, going to meetings, working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a journey that's beyond, you know, in California. Uh, like I said, I started, you know, going to a lot of meetings and staying sober and not drinking and, you know, working the program. And and what happened after I was two years sober and I met this gal one year sober. And it was like AA boy meets AA girl on AA campus, you know. And uh, I started working. I had a job. I went to, actually went back. Uh, I went to a trade school, and I recommend it. You know, it was air conditioning and heating. And the best thing about that job, I loved doing it. Because when I fixed somebody's air conditioning or heater, they'd write me out a check with a smile in here, you know. And uh, it was just, it was an awesome trade. You know, it really was. It was just something that I enjoyed doing for other people. And, uh, in fact, my son and I, the last six years I worked, we worked together in California. But anyway, you know, the uh, journey of sobriety, me and this gal was together for 22 years, you know. We bought a house in California. She was in the realtor. She was a realtor. We bought a good house. And... Uh, Numbers-wise, you know, we paid 80000 for it. Then when I moved out here, I got 400000 for it, you know. And I actually paid for my house here in Chino cash. And uh, I haven't made a house payment in 13 years, you know, pretty good deal, you know, pay my taxes and stuff like that. And, um, but anyway, <clears throat> after... 22 years she passed away suddenly she was in the hospital for like three days and uh, I remember I got uh, she died on a Friday about one o'clock and what happened I took off work early to go visit her and when I walked up to the room her kids were out there and she said Pat just passed away and I just came unglued you know, really, you know, it was just very, very emotionally. And what happened is that, uh, and like I said, I kind of drifted away from AA. I wasn't going to a lot of meetings back then. But what happened, and I can remember it awesome, is that I wanted to drink more than anything else because I know how that worked with my emotions and my feelings. And... <clears throat> I remember going to the phone, and like I say, here we go again, you know, this is what we do in AA. I picked up the phone, and I called my best friend in AA. I says, John, I said, get my ass to an AA meeting. And that was September 3rd, 1995. And I've been, I didn't drink, and I got totally 100% involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's the way it's been, you know, for almost 25 years. September will be 24 years, I think, when she passed away. And uh, i totally involved in Alcoholics Anonymous in Chino Valley. They actually hand me the envelopes with money in it. And I'm not even the treasurer. You know, they just hand it to me, and I go to the bank on every Monday with whatever they give me, and I deposit it to the AA account. And I pay the uh, rent on our room out there in Chino. We have a place on Perkinsville Road, 15 meetings a week. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, and I'm five minutes away. And going to the meetings, you know, like I say, uh, I, I just go because it's a way of life that's giving me a way of life, you know. And... Uh, 
Love Alcoholics Anonymous because it's a journey that each and every one of us can go on. You know, you do not have to do this alone. From my experience, if you think you can do it alone, wrong. You know, AA is a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease. And without help, it's too much for us. You know, there's no age limit. Believe me, on Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, if, if, if you want what we have, you do what we do. And that's by showing up at meetings, getting involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. Service work is a big factor in AA, you know. Uh, you have to give it away to keep it. And by giving it away, I just suit up and show up, you know. And uh, when Kirk asked me a couple weeks ago to share, I said, yeah, I, you know, it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous that this is a program of action. The more action you put into AA, the more you get out of it, you know. And I'm talking about just not coming to meetings, get involved in Alcoholics Anonymous in some way, shape, or form, you know. There's always something to do. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, uh, me and my friend, you know, before she passed, we went down to San Diego because I got sober in L.A. And I still got friends in L.A. You know, I talk to them once in a while. And San Diego, you know, uh, I got a friend. I've been sponsoring him for 23, 24 years. In fact, tomorrow's is, is AA birthday. And I got to call him. And I will. You know, wish him a happy birthday. And uh, But the fellowship is just something beyond. You know, uh, it's... Any, oh, <laughs> back to the county jail in Los Angeles. I remember I was, I left a, when I was, somebody came to visit me, and I'm walking back to my cell, and I don't know if any of you know Charlie Manson, but I'm walking down this aisle, and here comes two guards with this guy, you know, walking towards me, and when I get 10, 12 feet away, I recognized who it was, you know, Charlie Manson. And this is what I did. I went, hey, man, you know, like I knew him, you know, really. And uh, he goes, yeah, you know. And uh, that's where I was headed, you know, in some way, shape, or form. You know, uh, he, he murdered, I don't know, him and his family or murdered three or four women there in Hollywood. But, uh, you know, it was crazy insanity. And the thing is, you know, getting sober, you know, I haven't been in jail once. Cops came to the house once, you know. Uh, I think me and my wife got in an argument, and she called the police for whatever reason. But anyway, you know, I haven't been to jail. I live a pretty good life. You know, and it's one day at a time. You know, it's not how long you're sober or you're thinking about tomorrow or the next day. I try to live in the present, you know, and that is truly a gift because my head can take off and go anywhere, you know. And the thing is, is, if I can live in the now, that's truly a gift. You know, they talk about it's living in the present, you know, and that's a gift. You know, I'm... My head just don't run 100 miles an hour anymore, you know. If I can live in the now, that's where it's at, really, you know. Uh, that don't mean I don't think about tomorrow or the next day, but I don't dwell on it. I don't get involved in it. You know, it's just a fleeting thought. But sobriety, here I go again, you know, is number one. Before any person, place, thing, or situation in my life, my sobriety is number one, you know, because what you guys have given me is, damn, you know, what a journey, you know, what a journey. And the fellowship, you know, I thrived on the fellowship from the get-go. You know, like I said, the old-timers told me exactly what I was doing, when I was doing it, and how I was doing it. And that's what I try to share today. You know, this is a program, if you want what we have, you do what we do. And that's by suiting up and showing up and coming to meetings and 
getting involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I always say the more you put into AA, the more you get out of it. You know, it's a journey beyond description. And to me, you know, uh, being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is the best deal in town. It really is, you know. Uh, life is good. There's ups and downs in life. When I first came in, I was sniveling about something, and my sponsor told me, he says, Jerry, when you come into AA, your highs and lows are like this. But the longer you're sober, they go like that. And how true that is today, you know. I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot, you know. After the gal that died, you know, three or four years later, I got married, and me and my wife came out here in 2006, and she died in 2007, hepatitis C. And uh, I got through that, and life goes on, you know. Uh, by not drinking, I have grown emotionally, mentally, and spiritually in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And uh, uh, spiritually, you know, I just love to go out hiking. When I go out hiking, I stop, sit on a rock or a log, and listen to the birds chirp or the wind blowing. You know, no cars, no people, you know. I'm just out there in the spiritual uh, foundation. And it, it feels good inside. You know, it's for real. You know, I don't have to consume or smoke or whatever, anything, you know. And I've uh, been there and done that, and that's not the way of life. The way of life is sobriety, one day at a time. And for that, I'm just forever grateful. Thanks. Thanks.